Hi guys, um, my name is Sanjay Gupta. I'm a consultant cardiologist in York. And today I wanted to talk to you about blood clots, particularly in atrial fibrillation. Okay, atrial fibrillation is a very common heart rhythm disorder. About 2.5 to 3% of the population in the Western world have atrial fibrillation. And one of the biggest risk factors, or one of the biggest risks with atrial fibrillation is that atrial fibrillation can be associated with formation of blood clots and the blood clot can get dislodged and go to the brain and cause strokes. So a lot of patients with atrial fibrillation are prescribed anticoagulants, medications which stop clot formation uh, because by stopping uh, clot formation, you reduce the risk of stroke. And with anticoagulants and good anticoagulation, the risk of stroke is reduced by 60%, 60 to 65%, okay? Now, the thing is that increasingly, there are now treatments available for people to get them out of atrial fibrillation, okay? And in particular, something like an ablation. So a lot of people are undergoing ablation and uh, then once they have had the ablation they say well now i'm cured of the atrial fibrillation and they go to their doctor and the doctor says well i think you should continue on your anticoagulant and most patients say well why do i need to continue on my anticoagulant when i've gotten rid of the atrial fibrillation and this is the theme of this video i'm hoping that i will be able to explain to you why it is important to continue on anticoagulation in the majority of patients with atrial fibrillation, even if they are no longer in atrial fibrillation. Okay. The first thing you need to understand is why blood clots form. And I did a video yesterday on why blood clots form. But in summary, there are three main things which affect um, um, clotting of uh, formation of blood clots. Okay. And um, the more of these three things you have, the more likely it is that you will have blood clot formation. The first is, if the blood is in some way abnormal, i.e. the blood is more coagulable or thicker, um, and um, then the blood is more likely to clot. The second thing is, if the blood isn't moving as well, if there is stasis of blood, for whatever reason, then the blood is more likely to clot. The third thing is, if you have damage to the vessel walls, the vessel in which the blood is traveling, and if those walls are damaged, then they affect the hemodynamic flow of the blood, and therefore blood is more likely to clot. Okay, so those are the three main factors. Now, in atrial fibrillation, the reason it has always been thought that atrial fibrillation increases the risk of blood clots is simply because when you are in atrial fibrillation, the atria are not contracting. And because they're not contracting, you get this stasis, the blood is not moving as well. And because the blood is not moving as well, it was felt that that predisposed the blood to clot and that clot would then cause a stroke, okay? So the question is then, well, if you then get the atria moving again, why do you need to worry about clot formation? Okay, And <clears throat> it's very interesting um, because there was an interesting paper uh, several years ago by Professor Bernard Gersh, uh, who is, I think, in America or in Canada. Uh, if you head over to my Facebook page, I'll try and put the links for the papers. Okay, And we know that there are two types of atrial fibrillation. There are those people who are generally completely healthy but have atrial fibrillation. And then there are other people who have diabetes, high blood pressure, uh, who are older, who also have atrial fibrillation. And what Professor Gersh did was he decided to study those patients who have atrial fibrillation but were otherwise completely healthy. These are people who have lone AF, okay? They don't have diabetes, they don't have high blood pressure, they're generally young. So in those people, um, if you study them over the over a, a, a medium to long term, uh, he found that the risk of stroke was extremely low. So these patients had atrial fibrillation. They didn't have any of the other risk factors like diabetes, high blood pressure, etc. 
And in them, without anticoagulation, the risk of stroke was extremely low. He then decided to study those people who have atrial fibrillation, but they also have diabetes, they also have high blood pressure, they also have all these other comorbidities. And in those people, when they were studied, he found that these people had a much higher risk of having strokes and having heart failure and dying. Okay. So the point is that if you have atrial fibrillation and it exposes your risk just for strokes, then why the difference between those people who have AFib and nothing else and those people who have AFib and other comorbidities such as diabetes, high blood pressure, etc.? And therefore, you have to start asking the question, is it the AFib itself which is causing the stroke or is it the company that the AFib keeps which causes the stroke? And <clears throat> It can't just be the atrial fibrillation because you've got two groups of people who have AFib. One group of people doesn't, have, doesn't get the strokes. One group of people does. Uh, so it can't just be about the atrial fibrillation that is leading to the stroke. And therefore, we feel that it is likely that the atrial fibrillation is not, you know, traditionally we used to think, oh, stroke was the offspring of atrial fibrillation. Now we're beginning to say maybe atrial fibrillation is just a marker of people who are high, at a higher risk of having strokes. So atrial fibrillation occurs in people who have diabetes. Diabetes can cause stroke. Atrial fibrillation occurs in people who have high blood pressure. And maybe um, the stroke happens in these people because they have these comorbidities and the atrial fibrillation is just a marker, i.e. indicates a person at a slightly higher risk. Um, okay, and <clears throat> now people have been starting to do studies looking at patients who have never had atrial fibrillation, okay, but they're looking at their comorbidities uh, and measuring their chads 2 vasc scores. I'll talk to you about the chads 2 vasc scores. And they're finding that people who have high chads 2 vasc scores but have never had atrial fibrillation in their lives probably have the same risk of having strokes as people who have CHADS2 vasc scores, which are equivalent, but also have atrial fibrillation. And that makes you think that maybe it's the CHADS2 vasc, you know, the comorbidities, the company that atrial fibrillation keeps that exposes you to the risk of strokes, not the atrial fibrillation itself. Let's talk about what company it keeps. Remember, the risk of stroke can be calculated using this thing called the CHADS2 VASC score. Okay, let me go through this. CHAD is C for the CHADS2 VASC score. C stands for congestive heart failure. Congestive heart failure means that the heart is not working as well as it should. Something that causes stasis, the blood is not going to move. So if you have AFib and congestive heart failure, you have a much, um, you have more stasis within the heart. Also, congestive heart failure causes inflammation. It can cause all sorts of vessel wall damage because of a lack of oxygen going around the body. And so it also causes uh, damage to the vessel walls. You know, you get, you get, um, you get um, um, uh, uh, affectation of the streamlined flow of blood. And that's another reason. Let's talk about the H in Chad's do the hypertension, high blood pressure. High blood pressure, again, causes damage to the vessel walls. It causes hardening of the arteries. And that's why um, high blood pressure increases your risk of strokes, particularly in combination with high, uh, heart failure or atrial fibrillation. A stands for age. Now, as you get older, everything gets affected. You get more stasis because you become more sedentary. You, um, your blood becomes more hypercoagulable and you develop hardening of the arteries. So all three risks, and that's why age is such a huge risk factor for the development of strokes in the CHADS2 VAST scoring system. Sex, okay, uh, female sex, we know that women uh, are more likely to have strokes than men in atrial fibrillation, and that is because of hormones, okay? And particularly hormonal changes can affect the coagulability of blood and make the blood more uh, hypercoagulable.
Then they talk about stroke. Well, of course, if you've had a previous stroke, you're going to have much more likelihood because stroke causes vascular damage. Okay, so the blood vessel is affected. And then they talk about vascular disease. And again, if you have disease of the walls of the vessel, then you're more likely to have it. So whilst it's true to say atrial fibrillation confers stasis, it's all these other things, you know, the heart failure, the high blood pressure, the age, the diabetes, which really increase your risk of having strokes. And that is why when you calculate the risk of stroke, there is no place in the CHATS2 VASC scoring system which says, is the patient in AFib, okay? The risk of stroke is not dependent on whether you are in AFib or not. It's dependent on the company that your AFib keeps. And that is why uh, uh, even if the AFib is taken out of the equation because you've had an ablation or whatever, it is recommended that if the company that the AFib has kept is still there, uh, is, is there, then you need to be on anticoagulants. Remember, your chads to vasc score can only ever go up. It can't go down. The reason is because you can only ever get older. You can only ever develop diabetes. You can only ever develop high blood pressure. You don't, it doesn't go the other way. And therefore, um, if your risk is high, you need to be on anticoagulants for life because regardless of whether you're an AFib or not an AFib, regardless of whether someone tells you whether your AFib has been cured or not, you still need to take the anticoagulants. There is going to be a study soon where they're going to look at people who have never had AFib. They're going to calculate the CHADS2 VASC score and they're going to work out what the risk of strokes is. But and this is going to be a big study, but there is a lot of data now coming out which suggests that the risks are equivalent regardless of whether you have AFib or not. Another reason to understand why it's important is, sure, um, you know, you can have an ablation and you may think, okay, well, my AFib is gone. Uh, but remember, AFib can be silent. So it can come back. And if it does come back, you may not necessarily know about it. And therefore, when people come and say to me, well, look, you know, if I had more AFib, I'll come back to you and I'll start on an anticoagulant again. And I say to them, well, it can sometimes be silent. And that's why you may not know that you've gone back into AFib. And that's why it's important to be more vigilant about just taking the anticoagulants regardless if your CHADS2 VASC score is high enough. Number two, of course, remember that just because you've had an ablation and that's offered you um, freedom from atrial fibrillation symptoms, the AFib can recur. It can recur. You know, and many people that I speak to will say, look, you know, I had the ablation, I felt great for two years, then it came back. So it doesn't necessarily guarantee you that you are completely cured of atrial fibrillation. The atrial fibrillation may recur. It may be that you require two procedures. It may be required three procedures. We don't know, but there's always that possibility that it can recur. And that's again, you know, that's fine. You can tackle that, but you want to be covered against the risk of strokes if it did recur, okay? Um, and that's really why it is generally recommended that once a, once AFib has declared itself, and if you have the comorbidities like diabetes, high blood pressure, being old, etc., then you should remain on anticoagulation for life, regardless of whether your AFib remains or not. All right. So I hope this was helpful. Um, let me just plug my website. Hang on. So let me just tell you a little bit about me. Okay, so my name is Sanjay Gupta. I'm a consultant cardiologist. Um, some people say, well, look, you know, he's not an electrophysiologist. What does he know? Uh, and I suppose, you know, that's, uh, that's a reasonable view. Uh, but uh, I do look after a ton of patients with atrial fibrillation. And therefore, I do try and keep up to date with what's coming out. Uh, but of course, you know, if you, have, if you have access to an electrophysiologist and you want to seek a second opinion, uh, it's always a really good idea. Um, uh, and this is my website, uh, yourcardiology.co.uk. Uh, you know, um, uh, I'll try and put some information up there about this. 
Uh, you can always email me. Uh, it's always an, really nice to get new Facebook um, friends because uh, we can be a lot more interactive on Facebook. Um, I'm also on Twitter, but I don't quite know how to use Twitter. It's your cardiology um, again on Twitter. Um, and uh, that's about it, really. So I hope you found this useful. Um, it's worth saying that I am doing a talk next Tuesday at lunchtime uh, in York for patients who suffer from atrial fibrillation, uh, where I can be a lot more interactive and I can ask, answer specific questions. But in the interim, if you have any questions, don't hesitate, just drop me a line and I will try and get to them and answer them for you. Okay, so thank you so much. Please keep watching, please keep subscribing, um, and uh, I wish you good night.